Hey y'all, you listen to the Gary Owen Podcast. <laughs> Hashtag get some. Hey, what's up everybody? This is Gary Owen with the Get Some Podcast. Uh, you can listen to this on iTunes. Just search Gary Owen. Hashtag get some. Or watch it on YouTube. YouTube.com backslash Gary Owen com. Start right off the bat with my tour dates. Uh, this weekend, July 25th, the 28th. I'm in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania at Helium Comedy Club. Then next weekend, August 1st through the 4th, I am in Cleveland, Ohio at the Improv. And August 30th, I'm in Robinsonville, Mississippi, which is basically right outside of Memphis at the Horseshoe Casino, August 30th. Then August 31st, I'm actually in the Bahamas. Uh, so I got I to gotta find the info on that, what the venue is. But I know I'm in the Bahamas on Saturday August 31st. Uh, if you notice, there's a big gap in between August uh, 4th, my last day in Cleveland, and then August 30th, my next date. It's because I, I booked uh, I booked a film. Not allowed to say what it is yet. Uh, the studio likes to make the announcement, but I'm off all of August. I'll be in Winnipeg, Canada, filming a new movie. And it's an action movie. Like I get my ass kicked a couple times. I'm not, I'm not fighting nobody. I get my ass kicked. As I'm recording this, uh, we recorded from my house. I have told my son repeatedly I'm getting a record, and he decides to put some food in the microwave at the exact time that we are starting this podcast. So if you hear some beeps, it's because my son is being rude. He doesn't care that I'm trying to build a dynasty with my podcast. He is more concerned about his microwave teriyaki chicken than providing, I don't know, a better life for everybody. Uh, speaking of podcasts, oh, oh, and, and this Friday is my birthday, July 26th, uh, a day to live in infamy. You know what? I'm going to look up famous people born on July 26th, and I bet you I don't pop up born because I'm, I'm black famous on July 26th. Uh, let me see. Uh, boom. Famous, famous birthdays, July 26th. Let's see. There's a bunch of people I have never heard of. Carson Luters is a pop singer. Elizabeth Gillies. Uh, Amanda Steele. Kate Beckinsale. Mm, we have the exact same birthday. Same year and everything. Michael Campion. Sandra Bullock. Uh, Stormies is a rapper. Erica Desmond. TikTok star. Jason Statham. Uh, Scott Cowan. Back, Mick Jagger. Uh, Zach Kornfeld, YouTube star, Taylor Mumson, rock singer, Roger Taylor, drummer, Aris Munoz, Instagram star, Joe Jackson, Michael Jackson's dad, Kevin Spacey, uh, nope, maybe I don't want to share that with him, uh, Guy Tang is a stylist, Amari Walton is an Instagram star, Helen Mirren, July 26, Chris Harrison is a TV host, uh, there's a bunch of YouTube people on here. Bianca Santos is, is a vlogger. They got people on here, and I am nowhere to be found. Miriam McDonald, TV actress. Stanley Kubrick, even though he passed away, uh, great director. Nathan James, the singer, uh, YouTube star. C Con, rapper. Are you fucking shitting me? They got the top 50 celebrity birthdays on July 26th, and I'm not on it. But you know who is on it? Bad Kid Michael, Instagram star. Uh, who else? Uh, just I'm going to ask you guys if you know some of these names. I'm not going to say what they do. Francia Rasa, A-O-K-D, uh, Armani Walton, uh, Courtney Quinn, Georgia Bridgers. Okay. Who made it? Let, let, I should look up black famous people born on July 26th. Famous born black people on July 26th. Oh, okay. Uh, let's see. Why did Will Smith's name? I know he wasn't born on July 26th. Will Smith. I don't know. His birthday isn't there. Michael Illy's a Leo. I know that. I know that, but uh, 
Let me see. I don't know. Yeah, a little disappointed with that list. What the hell? Uh, so anyways, talking about podcast and uh, people, I I did Theo Vaughn's podcast um, last month. I had a good time on it, and I like Theo. But then when people bring your name up and they keep talking about you in the podcast, it always gets back to you. Just like Brian Callen and Brendan Schaub got back to me when they brought me up. So somebody sent me Leo uh, Theo Vaughn was on with uh, Tom Segura. And I didn't know Tom Segura was born in Cincinnati and lived there until he was nine years old. I didn't know that. And if you don't know who Tom Segura is, he's a funny comedian. His last movie was Instant Family with Mark Wahlberg. And he's got a he's got a very, very, very popular podcast, him and his wife. And so he's he's interviewing Tom and he's in Cincinnati. He goes, you know, Gary was from Cincinnati. And Tom goes, uh, oh yeah. He goes, he goes, I never met him. He goes, what? He goes, yeah, I never met him. That's why I say comedians, man, we we pass each other on the road, but we never see each other. Like Tom Segura is one of those people that I see him coming to a comedy club and or leaving a comedy club like the week before I get there. Like we we've probably been to the same cities, same comedy clubs for ten years, and I've never met the guy. So I'm putting it out there. I would like to do his podcast. I'm I'm enjoying going on other people's podcasts lately. Uh, it's just fun, and and he's it, but Theo goes. He goes, he goes, what's he like? Tom said that to Theo. Theo goes, ah, uh, I like Gary, but Gary seems like the type that you have to talk to him. I'm not going to reach out and talk to you. And which is fair, which is fair assessment to me, because when I go into a room and I've said this numerous times, I'm not the loud guy in the room. Now, get a couple drinks to me. The party's going. I might become the party guy, but just to walk into a room with people that I'm not sure if they know me or not, I'm not the loud guy. I'm that guy just because I'm a comedian. I'm going to be cutting up. And maybe that's true when I've been to comedy clubs in the past that I just, if I if I happen to stop by the comedy store just because I'm in L.A. and I'll stop by and say hi to some people or the Lafferty Improv, if I see a bunch of comics together, uh, I usually am still just an observer. And it's, I, I think people can misconstrue that as being standoffish, but I'm just observing. But if you are a comic and you approach me and start talking, you know, I've, I love to have conversations, especially about stand up and people's journeys in the business. But I think with, and I've only stopped at a comedy store a couple times in the last probably 10 years. And when I stop there, it's almost like Bigfoot stops by. Like there's, it's like a sighting of me shows up. I've heard comics say that, like, we're just not expecting you to be there. Because you expect the normal faces, like like the Joe Rogans, Brendan Schaub's, and and Sebastians, and all those people that are live in L.A. and that's where they go to work out. And I just don't live there, so I don't go there a lot. So, uh, hey, how's it going? Just in the middle of the podcast. Nobody cares. Th- this this whole house, they could care less that I'm working right now. Nobody cares. Uh, so, anyways, that's why I think Theo said that. I could be wrong. But I'm guessing that's the reason. Uh, but like I said, I like Theo too. Can you guys hear the microwave beep? Because right now it's chaos in my house. Now keep in mind, uh, we are celebrating my birthday today at my house because I won't be here. I'll be in Philadelphia this weekend. So when I when I heard Theo say that, I, at first I was like, hey, hold on. I thought I had a good time with Theo. And the pause is what's not scared me, but gave me hesitation. Like, you know, I, I like Gary. But, and you know, and Tom Segura said, he said, well, that's fair. He goes, he's created his own lane. So almost like Tom Segura's like, he has a right to step back and you should approach him. Uh, it's almost like what he said, but it's, I don't, I don't, maybe it come, I can see how it could come across as standoffish, but it's not my intention. It's just, I think most comedians, that's why we were so funny. We're always like soaking in the environment. And how can this be funny or why is he doing that? Or so I just think I'm an observer when I'm out, you know, a lot of times I'll be out like in a coffee shop by myself and I'll just sit in the back and huh? Yeah. You can open the door. These people here, man. I can't wait till school starts. I cannot wait till school starts. Like my kids are grown. They're grown. They should not be interrupting the podcast and they slam the door like we're in a jail cell and it's on lockdown. Like the, 
we have nice doors. Just close them softly. They'll close. Uh, see, I, I, you know, getting back to Theo, you know, I, I, I like, I'm going to do a Theo. What do you think of Theo Vaughn? Ah, uh, I like Theo. <laughs> nah, but I, I can see where, uh, he comes from if he, if, for him saying that I, I seem like you should approach me, but that's really, it's really not my intention. It's just that like I'm observing situations. And, and when I, when the few times I've been to the comedy store, I didn't assume everybody knew me. I just thought maybe they don't know who I am, you know, and I, I imagine the, all the headliners will, but if you're a new comic coming up and I don't, I'm at the comedy store, I don't, I don't know if you know who I am or not. So it's, I'm just kind of sitting back almost like a fly on the wall. So I'm not being standoffish. I'm just trying to assess the situation. Like what's going on at the comedy club tonight? Who knows me? Who doesn't, uh, you know, but I, uh, there was a time I knew everybody at the comedy club. All the comedy clubs, when you are when you first get to L.A. and you're open micing, you know everybody. Uh, now I go there, I don't know half the people. I'm like, I'm not sure who that dude is. Like, I know a lot of people's faces, but I don't know everybody's names. Uh, so on a side note, though, this week I watched uh, Chris Heron. He did a um, thing on ESPN called The First Day. And for those who don't know who Chris Heron is, uh, we've been friends for four years now. I met Chris when when my brother passed away in May of 2015. I met Chris that October. They had this benefit in Washington, D.C. called Face and Addiction. And there was a big concert. Like, Aerosmith was there. Joe Walsh from the Eagles. Uh, 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 was it Crow? Cheryl Crow. I almost said Sarah Crow. Cheryl Crow was there. Uh, Dr. Oz. It was a huge event on the mall in dc now the concert was saturday night the big concert saturday and saturday night and but they had a comedy show on friday night so i asked to do the comedy show and they put me on it was me bill burr um god i can't remember who else there were some great comics on that show though tig tig nagara she was on it uh but so i go up and that was the night that was the night on that comedy show that i first um, had voiced publicly how my brother died and I said on stage and then I found out Chris Hammer was going to be speaking the next day because they would have music acts go up and then in between the music acts different uh, people would tell their stories of, of people in recovery of how because that's the thing I, I've learned you never say uh, somebody is an ex-addict they're in recovery because really you're always an addict the addiction is always there it's just now you're in recovery so they had all these people in recovery that spoke in between the music acts and would tell their, give their testimony and tell their story. And Chris was one of the people that was going to be speaking. And so you had thousands on top of thousands of people there for the concert, the outdoor concert. But then they had like a, a private tent where the artists could hang out and then, you know, sponsors and everything. And they were serving food and, and stuff like that. I, no, no drinks, no drinks in the recovery tent. I almost said food and drinks. When I say drinks, I mean water, soda, juice, Gatorade. Uh, but Chris was one of the people speaking, so that's where we met that day. And then we exchanged info, and we stayed in touch. And I actually got him to come to my high school a year later uh, to speak uh, to speak at my high school as part of my my TV show when I had the Gary Owen show. So, but Chris put stipulations that. We couldn't record him speaking to my school. Uh, so we recorded him at my house giving me advice because I talked to the kids too at my high school about addiction and, and childhood trauma. And I knew why he didn't want us to speak because I was like, he doesn't want, he doesn't want, one, he didn't want his uh, words cut up. Like his, when he talks to kids, it's for an hour, hour and a half straight, and it's science in the room. And he didn't want his message to be cut up into a three-minute bit, basically. If you're going to get the message out, get the message out there. And, you know, he's he's not in it for the fame or the money. He's really trying to help kids. And now when I saw the first day on ESPN, that, I was like, I'm so glad Chris said that to us because it wouldn't have got the boom factor that it did on ESPN because Chris, now he went to like five different schools 
and they spliced his hour speech, which is basically the same to all the schools, into uh, they spliced it together so it looked like one show. So you'd see him in a different shirt. And then you see the kids are different, but the reaction was the same. Like when you hear him speak at these schools about addiction and his story, you can hear a pin drop in these schools. And the few times I've seen him speak, I'm like, I don't know how he does it. I don't know how he can get through talking to all these kids without, you know, breaking down. I mean, I'm dang near tearing up, but I'm just listening and over the TV. So if you get a chance Make sure you watch the first day. If you got ESPN on demand or just look it up, and it's worth a download. But Chris had said, and he said this every time I've seen him speak, he says, You going to eat that in your room? No. Don't eat, don't get that on the carpet. I'm not. Kids, man. We bought, let me tell you something. We bought, I'm going to get sidetracked with you. My son just took a microwave dinner in the other room where we specifically told our kids don't eat on the couch because they're messy. I mean, don't eat where there's carpet because they're messy. And I just saw him sneaking some microwave dish into his room. And if we went on this podcast, this would be a different story, but I'm going to get through this. But trust, my son's about to get an earful. What? <laughs> the Hulk's going to come out. My son calls me the Hulk when I go off. Uh, but yeah, I didn't want to argue on the podcast. But uh, yeah, he Chris has always said when we when we think about people uh, addicts and we see homeless people on the side of the highway, or we see drug addicts just at their worst, we always focus on that day. He goes, but he goes, I like to focus on the first day. Like what made them get to that point? You know, we focus on their worst day and not the first day. And that's always stuck with me whenever I see somebody like what got them to that point to, you know, make them that what's the first day that led to that decision that's led to you being homeless or led you being a drug addict. Like, and he, he goes into detail of how he used to use drugs, man, that guy, that guy. I mean, the fact that he played for the Boston Celtics and was meeting his dealer outside of the Boston garden before tip off. Like he's talking like a half hour for the game. He's outside in his full uniform sweatsuit over it, waiting for his dealer to show up at the Boston Garden so he could get his drugs before the game. I'm like, man, there's addicts, and then there's fun functioning addicts, what he was. And, you know, I just – every school out there, junior high and high school, should – it should be a requirement that you have an assembly. And even if you don't watch it with the whole school, every class should watch it at least. It's just an hour. So you got to take an hour of I, – I encourage all the, every coach uh, to show their team that. Uh, I made sure we all watched it in my house. Uh, so, yeah, if you get a chance, it's Chris Heron the first day. Now, they did – ESPN did one like four or five years ago where it was Chris Heron unguarded. And that was how he was an addict and how, he, how all of a sudden he got sober. Not all of a sudden, but how he did get sober after being an addict. The first day – is nothing but him going back to certain high schools and talking to him about addiction. And when I tell you it's man, it's powerful. Like my wife called and I, I was watching in my hotel room and I was like, I got to call you back. And she goes, what? I said, I just got to call you back. I couldn't even explain to her why I had to call her back. I said, I j please don't interrupt me. I got to call you back. And I called her back like 20 minutes later. I said, I was watching the first day with Chris Heron. And then I just shot him a text and I told him, I said, man, I said, that was the perfect title to that um espn program i said because every time i hear you talk it's just like that the first time uh so yeah it was uh if you get a chance just watch that 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 chris heron story documentary now to switch gears a little bit uh there's um the there was a big uproar in the in the comedy community because there's a comedian named dina hasham I think I think I pronounced it right. I hope so. But she's a comedian and she did a joke on XXX Tentacion's death. She said him dying to go he was buying a car for I think fifty thousand dollars in cash and he got robbed and he lost his life because some some thugs, some dumbasses who didn't want to work hard for themselves tried to take the easy road and they killed him over some money. And she said that would have been a perfect Venmo commercial reasons to use Venmo. And 
you know, I she got a lot of backlash from a lot of XX Tentacion fans, which keep in mind, a lot of his fans are young and they're emotional. And but she issued an apology for the joke. And whether I agree with the joke or I don't agree with the joke, uh, I just think I stand behind Dina on this. And I don't know her at all. I don't know her at all. Uh, I had never heard of her. Uh, and the joke was funny. Uh, if if you're not emotionally attached to XXX Tentacion, because she wasn't saying he deserved to die. She wasn't saying he was a bad human being. She was just making a dark situation and making it, trying to spin it and make it funny. I mean, there's that's that's comedians jobs. That's our jobs is to make dark situations funny, please. And I don't want to die anytime soon. Don't get it twisted. But whenever that time comes, however I pass away, if comedians don't make fun of me, I'm going to be disappointed. I'm going to be just, I'm going to be like, <laughs> even though I won't be here, I won't know, but I just think that's our job. I, don't, I mean, if it's, if I, something happens, I lose a limb. I'm joking about it. If I make it through, if I lose an arm or a leg for whatever reason, if I'm in the forest and a bear gnaws my leg off, yeah, I'm going to be in pain. I'm going to be depressed. But when I come out of it, trust them, I have some bear eating leg jokes. <laughs> and I, and I'm fair game to any comic that wants to make fun of me. That's on a show with me, please make fun of me. I mean, it's just, it makes everything easier. And if you're not, like I said, if you're not an XXX Tentacion fan, and I saw the I saw the rapper Stitches. He was going off, but that's his guy. That's his friend. So in his mind, he's defending his friend. So I I, I get that, but I on this I am on Dina's side. Dina Hashan, and I really hope I'm pronouncing her name right. I I really hope, uh, because she doesn't she did there wasn't listen. There's jokes, and then there's jokes with malicious intent behind it. There was no malicious intent behind her joke at all. But then and she's getting death threats and Comedy Central took the joke down. It's not going to air now, but I mean, it's already out there. So, you know, I, I, I understand her, her apologizing because her, her thing was, I wasn't here to hurt anybody. I wasn't, I wasn't, like I said, there was no malicious intent behind the joke. And I saw stitches going off, like calling her a cunt and, she, and hey, listen, I I've liked I've liked how the the rapper Stitches I liked how he's turned his whole life and vibe around because he was he was wild in there for a while and then he got clean and so I just think people take a step back, uh, look at what the joke was. If it's if it's not XXX Tentacion, if she just said I read where a guy got killed over. They, they robbed him of $50,000 cash. He's buying a car. She doesn't say the rapper's name, and she says the joke. Then I think a lot of people would laugh about it. But as soon as XXX Tentacion's name came out of her mouth, uh, that's, that's when everybody went nuts. Because all they heard was his name and him dying. And it, and it sucks. I mean, he didn't deserve what happened to him. But like I said, she, didn't, she wasn't going after him in general, saying he deserved it. She would just... Making a joke about Venmo is really what it was. And listen, uh, every joke we tell, people can get offended. It, it, I tell you, I'll tell you a couple stories. This past weekend, I was in Minnesota. Uh, and shouts out to everybody in Minnesota that came out. We had a great weekend at the Mall of America, man. Those shows were fire. Uh, but I do, I got a, a, a bit, in my, a bit in my act right now about cerebral palsy. And like I said, there's no malicious intent behind my joke. But it was funny because I literally had a guy come up to me and said, yo, I work with a couple of people that have cerebral palsy. You know, whatever line of work he's in, he goes, they would have freaking loved that joke. Because I talk about how, oh, I feel like I when I tell the joke, I go, sorry about that. After I tell the joke, I apologize. I'm apologizing now so you guys can't be mad at me because you got to apologize for every joke you say now. And literally a guy came up to me afterwards. I'm doing a meet and greet. And he said, man, those kids, those kids. He said, those guys would have loved that joke. And I said, isn't it funny how when you talk about a certain group of people, a lot of times it's not the majority of that group or even that group that's offended. It's people that are trying to defend them. 
Because like I said, I do a lot of I do a lot of racial jokes, and the black people ninety five percent of the time never get offended by it. It's it's white people. Like why are you offended? If black people aren't. Same thing with this, like cerebral palsy. I guarantee you, my joke about cerebral palsy, it's not malicious. I have I have constructed in a way that I'm not attacking that community at all. But I am making fun of their mannerisms and 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 things of that nature. Uh, but it's all in fun. You can tell, like I said, there's nothing malicious behind it. And but I guarantee you, and I talk about it in my act. I I said, now we're all laughing, but I know there's at least one person in here. That's not that's not happy about the joke. And I, I go, I act like I'm offended. I act like I'm someone in the audience that's offended the joke. So I kind of disarm it because I first I make fun of somebody's cerebral palsy. Then I, I then I make fun of the person that's offended by it all within the same bit. And then I then I then I apologize for the joke during the joke. So when I leave there, nobody can really say, oh, <laughs> that joke is messed up. Nah, I, I do a joke that I attack it from every angle. First, I I make fun of not even somebody with cerebral palsy, just cerebral palsy. I make make fun of it. Then I make fun of the guy that's offended in the audience. Then I apologize for even tell, ta- telling the joke. But it's it's like I said, there's nothing malicious behind it. But I guarantee you, uh, when that joke hits the air, and it's not in my new special. Uh, but it, it's going to be in the special, the next one coming up. I just, so I just recorded my new comedy special for Showtime. Now, yesterday I had to go down to LA and do a photo shoot for the the artwork for the for the special, and it came out great. So that special is going to air before the year's out, before 2019. I can't give the date because we don't have a, a a locked date yet from Showtime, but they guaranteed it's going to air before the year's out. So before December, it's going to air. Don't look for that cerebral palsy joke on that special. That special is called Doing What I Do. The next one, it's going to be on. And watch how I construct it. Or if you go see me live this weekend in Philadelphia or next weekend in Cleveland, uh, watch how I construct it. It's, I'm, I'm pretty proud of myself, how, I, how I've attacked it from all angles. Where you, you can't really be mad. So I just want to, if, if Dina Hasham happens to listen to my podcast or if anybody knows her, just tell her she, she has my support. And I think that's important. As comedians, we have to support each other. I don't have to agree with everyone's jokes. There's a lot of jokes that I don't think is funny or I think, ah, I wouldn't tell that type of joke. Jim Jeffries does a lot of jokes that I wouldn't tell. But I love watching someone like him tell them, like, you know, I don't. I have never seen a whole hour of his, but some of the bits that I've seen on YouTube and clips, I'm like God damn, that guy really goes there. Uh, and so I, I defend any comic on any kind of joke because we're we're really the last line of freedom of speech as comedians. And every time you start getting offended and making us take stuff off the air and apologize for every joke, then there's nothing left. And you know, we're we're quick to be in a what do you call it, a cancel culture. Now, I want to cancel somebody quick. We're really, when people are getting on you on the internet, it's usually just a few people, but they're making so much noise. Majority of people don't really care or they're not offended. Uh, Even the same thing, like I said, I had to go through it a couple years ago with the Special Olympics people because I did a Special Olympics joke in one of my specials. I was like, I had to go meet and, you know, jump through hoops and everything. And what I noticed is the people that were attacking me on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook about a special Olympics joke that I did. As soon as it died down and it went away and everything, they just went to the next comedian. I said, Oh, Oh, they're just, they're just attacking anybody. They're just attacking to attack. And when I was doing, when I was doing the joke about my cousin, who's got special needs, uh, when I was doing that joke, uh, she wasn't offended by it. And, And I just, I think that people, they just, people just want to be mad. And and when you, I notice, especially parents and relatives, when you have a special needs kid, it's like, where do you direct your anger? Because there has to be some kind of frustration there. Because if, if you live your life right and you're a husband and wife and you're, and you got a job and you're paying your taxes and you're, and you know, you're active in your community and you're doing everything right. And then you have a special needs kid. You're like, what? That's just a lifelong responsibility that you didn't see happening. Because if a kid is a special needs, they get 18 
and they go off on their own. They go to college, they go to military, they get a job, whatever. But eventually the plan is for them to leave the house. That's the goal whenever you have a kid. Uh, special needs kid, 9 out of 10 is never leaving the house. And that's a lifetime responsibility. And then also what a lot of people don't think is what happens to that kid after the parent passes away. Even if they're an adult and you're special needs and you have a eight-year-old mentality your whole life, you know, you're not going to be able to live on your own. And I think that is a stress. So I think a lot of times when people get mad, when you talk about special needs people, it's for that reason, they're, they don't know where to direct their frustration. Can't blame themselves. Can't blame the kid. Can't blame God. Who are you going to blame? I'm going to blame the guy that made the joke. That's where I, okay, now I have a reason to be angry and I have somebody to direct my anger. And what what's funny is, when somebody said to me one time, they go, uh, two things that happened. I remember when I when I made the special needs joke. One, they said, uh, I hope I have a special needs kid, and he is the biggest blessing and joy I've ever had in my life. And I hope karma kicks you in your ass one day, and you have a kid with special needs. And I messaged that person back. I said, So, you want me to have the biggest blessing and all the joy in the world that you have? They just said, Fuck you. That's all they said when they responded. And and another thing is. When I was doing this, when I used to do that special needs joke on stage about the Special Olympics, uh, I'd hear always hear somebody laughing, and they'd be like, "You going to hell, man? You going to hell?" I was like, "No, I ain't." I said, "It's God's creation, right? So God could have solved this problem if God would have made everybody the same. Then we don't have the, I don't have this joke. So whose fault is it?" Okay, there you go. So don't be saying I'm going to hell when God created people like that. So. Who's a, who's a fault? Okay, rest my case. Uh, so yeah, um, so yeah, just just Dina, I know you have my support out there. I know you didn't you didn't mean anything, and you weren't making light of anyone's death. You were just making a a, a dark situation and flipping it and making a joke out of it. And like I said, when when my time comes, please, please make jokes about me. It, it just keeps keeps me alive, keeps the memory alive. Uh, so, uh, oh, and, and, uh, yeah, it, it reminded me, okay, when, when I saw stitches go off on social media about XXX Tentacion's death, uh, it reminded me of when my brother passed away, uh, I'm talking a month after he died, uh, or maybe, maybe it was, I'm sorry, a couple months after he passed away, um, Saturday Night Live did one of their opening sketches about commercials and it was about heroin and it was all about, you know, somebody like they do like a vitamin commercial or cereal commercial. And it was heroin, you know, take heroin in the morning. It'll, it'll keep you going and it'll put you to sleep. And it was, they were making fun of people using heroin. And when I watched it and, and everyone sent it to me because they thought I was going to be upset about it. And when I really watched it, I was like, no, it was funny. And my and I thought about my brother, and I was like, my brother would have laughed at it. Even my brother being a heroin addict, he would have laughed at that sketch because they were just doing what all heroin addicts do. They were acting, they were do all the the characteristics and and behaviors and mannerisms. They that's what they do. I mean, heroin addicts are gonna steal. They'll steal from your mom. I mean, my brother, he literally, I love him to death, but I mean, you couldn't leave anything out when he was at the height of him using. I mean, Jesus, he he pawned my mom's wedding ring uh, to get heroin. I mean, they just, you know, he, he couldn't leave anything out. It got to the point where he, he couldn't come over to my house anymore. And I have to meet him out in public somewhere to see him just because I didn't, you know, he's got sticky fingers. That urge comes, you'll steal from anybody. When I say anybody, anybody. And, and when I watched it, I go, Dallas would have laughed at this. He would have laughed. And so I kind of laughed at it. And then people were like, aren't you mad? Are you going to say something about it? And I was like, no. I was like, they weren't saying Dallas, my brother. They weren't making fun of him. That Nobody knew him on SNL or the writing staff. They were just talking about heroin addicts in general. They, like I said, they were making light of a dark situation. And that's what we do. That's what comedians do. That's what SNL does. So I didn't take, I didn't take offense to it. I didn't take it personal. And, but... When I first saw it, it was a punch to the system. I was like, man, what the fuck? And then I had to sit back, and when I really watched it and thought about it, I go, okay, if my brother wasn't on heroin, 
and he wouldn't have passed away, I would have laughed my ass off at that sketch. But he did did pass away, did you? So I wouldn't say I was laughing at it, but I understood what they were doing. And I wasn't mad about it, and I got it, and I didn't want them to take it off the air, and I didn't think they needed to apologize for it or nothing. But, you know, when, when it hits home, you know, it does hit a little different, and I think that's what happened with, with Stitches and some of XXX Tentacion's fans when – when Dina made those jokes, they were they took it personal and they took it like she was attacking him when when she wasn't. She was just, you know, he's he's a hot bed. And, and the thing about it was everybody in that comedy club laughed. Everybody in that room when she told that joke laughed. And that's the goal. It's not to make people with the cameras on. You got to make those people in the room laugh because that's the energy you're getting when you're on stage. And they all laughed at it. So that's all. Just just you know. And I'm sure when this airs, I'll get some people going off on me and stuff. But that's fine. That's fine. I'm just saying I'm always going to stick with the comedian. So, so listen, right before I came on the air, I was uh, – I don't want to end on a dark, uh, a dark note today. Right before I came on the air, I was, uh, I was watching Wendy Williams with my wife. And notice I said with my wife because I'm not watching it by myself. My wife's got to watch it. And they were talking about uh, – Brad Pitt and Leonardo DiCaprio's new movie, which I can't wait to see. I think it's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. or Let me, let me look it up real quick. I don't want to give a bad title. I think that's the title name, though, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Uh, but it reminded me of a great Brad Pitt story that I, I don't know if I've shared in the past or not, but even if I have, it's still such a great story and says a lot about Brad Pitt. Uh, okay, actor. Damn, he's done a lot of movies. <laughs> Holy shit. This shit, this shit looks like a dictionary. Just keeps going. Uh, once upon a time. When's that, that? Does that come out this week? Actor. Once, a, uh, once upon a time in Hollywood. Yeah, he's playing a guy named Cliff Booth. So uh, I'm shooting this movie called College down in New Orleans. And every Friday, the all the crew, which actors are excluded and producers are excluded and directors are excluded, but all the crew would put uh, five dollars in this like coffee can, and they all got a number. And at the end of the day, or they all got they all put their names in. And at the end of the day, on Friday, they draw the name, and whoever the name is gets that can, gets what's ever in the can. And it, you know, there's a lot of crew members on a movie, uh, so it can get up to like a thousand dollars, you know. So everybody's putting in five dollars, and I'd always put in five dollars every Friday, even though I couldn't win. I just thought, you know, the crew's working hard, and I'm just giving a little extra, so I'd always put in five dollars too. So we're about four or five weeks into shooting, so I pull one guy aside. I go, "Hey, are any other actors putting in five dollars?" He goes, "Nah, just you." I go, "Yeah, who's the coolest actor on set?" So the guy goes, yeah, well, Brad Pitt used to match it. I go, what? So everybody, 90% of the crew that was working on the movie College in New Orleans were coming off of uh, The Curious Case of Benjamin Buttons. They had did that movie prior because uh, it was both movies were filmed in New Orleans. And he said, well, what Brad would do is Brad would ask how much is in the can. So if you say $1,000, Brad will put $1,000 in the can. I go, that motherfucker. <laughs> I said, so this whole time I'm thinking the crew's like, get the coolest actor ever. Screw Brad Pitt and Taraji and all these other people. When he told me, I said, man, they ain't thinking about my little $5. I said, you know what? What are we, week five? I want my $25 back. Because <laughs> you guys don't appreciate the $5 I put in every week. But I thought that was the coolest story that Brad would ask how much is in the can. And then whatever it was, if it's $1,000, he would put another 1000 in. I thought that was the coolest, one of the coolest things I've ever heard an actor do. And and that's why I he's one of the guys like I that's one of the guys I hope to work with one day. Like if you're gonna ask me, like I always say Denzel, but I'd probably be a little nervous because I'd be I better hit my fucking lines with Denzel. And then I'd probably be a little nervous to ad lib. Cause Denzel looks like a little little serious. Like you just you just make some shit up. Cause Denzel like, dude, I was ready to hit my line right here and you went left with it. <laughs> well Brad, I think, would probably go with it. <laughs> Uh yeah, so he's one of those guys I just uh I like uh I like to work with one day, especially after I heard that story. 
And I always thought he'd like me. I don't know why. I just thought Brad Pitt would like me if he met me. I, there's some people like I was like, yeah, I think he'd like me. If he got to know me, he'd probably think I'm cool as shit. Yeah, I just think he's one of those guys. Uh, I could be completely wrong. I don't know. But he just seems like one of those guys. All right, man. Well, uh, yeah. So, again, this weekend I am in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania at Helium Comedy Club. And next week I'm in Cleveland, Ohio at the Improv. And it's also my birthday this Friday. So if you're when you see this podcast, go ahead and, and throw me a message and wish me happy birthday. All right, y'all. I'll see you guys next week. This is Gary Owen with the Get Some Podcast. If you want to listen to my podcast, just go to iTunes, search Gary Owen, hashtag Get Some.